All right, we'll talk about PARP inhibition. Uh, we talked some about germline this morning. So, of course, you know, as already discussed, germline testing is now recommended for all men with high risk, very high risk of metastatic prostate cancer, and then the lower risk patients with family history, right? So, I mean, it, this should become very uh, routine for, for everyone treating prostate cancer patients. And, you know, the, the interest, of course, came, uh, has built for a number of years. You remember this pap paper from Dr. Pritchard uh, several years ago now. And, you know, between various data sets, you see a frequency of pathogenic germline mutations, you know, anywhere from, you know, maybe uh, 5% up to, you know, 25%, but you know, somewhere in that, you know, 10 to 15% range seems pretty consistent. And BRCA2 is, is certainly the most common germline mutation. Uh, ATM, the second most common, but then there's a long list of other germline mutations which happen with you know, meaningful frequency. You know, and keeping in mind that, that these, uh, these genes don't just lead to prostate cancer, they lead to other malignancies as well. So this really isn't just a conversation for the, uh, the, the prostate clinician, but also for you know, family care doctors and other physicians treating other malignancies. Now, where this became exciting the last couple of months is we finally have approved targeted agents targeting these uh, mutations in prostate cancer. So rucaparib and olaparib were both approved within a few days of each other for the treatment of men with BRCA mutant prostate cancer. And the labels are slightly different. You know, rucaparib was approved just for men with deleterious mutations in BRCA1 or 2 previously treated with docetaxel and one of, at least one of, abirenza. Whereas Olaparib has a much broader label. It's for MCRPC after only one of abirenza, no chemo requirement. And then deleterious germline mutations in BRCA1 or 2 or various other homologous recombination repair defects. And now this list here is the various genes that are included in that label indication. So, I mean, this is the basic background, and then I'm going to get maybe into a bit more um, contentious detail, but uh, just in the interest of time, I'm only highlighting one of the uh, studies here. This is the profound study that Olaparib was approved on. This is the PFS curve. The blue line is the patients on Olaparib. The red line is the standard of care control, which in this case was one of the oral agents, whichever one the patient hadn't seen before. And here's your overall survival curve. And in both cases, the hazard ratios are very positive, clear separation, right? This is cohort A, which is BRCA1 and 2 and ATM. This is cohort A and B, which includes then all of the other uh, genes. But really, the, the biggest focus probably over here in cohort A, since that's the biggest bucket. And then, you know, it's always important to look at the uh, you know, look at the toxicity curves, right? Because these are oral agents, so one anticipates that it will be uh, certainly available and, and of interest to the uh, advanced prostate cancer urology practices. And so the major toxicities with these drugs are myelosuppression. This is the laparib data. So, you know, 21% rate of grade three or higher anemia. Also GI toxicity, you know, some, uh, some nausea, some diarrhea, decreased appetite, fatigue, right? I mean, all kind of very common side effects, but, you know, the anemia kind of stands out. It makes the point that, you know, the people managing these drugs probably have to be ready to transfuse as necessary, right? But, you know, this is a, a table I pulled from an editorial uh, we, we just recently published in European Urology, breaking down the, the data from the various PARP inhibitor studies. You know, there's four of these drugs that are being used in clinical trials in prostate cancer. So, you know, we talked at first about the two drugs that have been approved so far. There's a myriad of studies ongoing, and you can anticipate further drug approvals in the future uh, in different parts of the disease spectrum and probably in combination therapies as well. You know, as I was talking about, the elaborate approval is very broad, covers, you know, a long list of, of potential gene mutations. You know, but I point this out uh, really just, just for nuance. I think it's important important that people appreciate that the hazard ratio, right, for overall survival in ATM mutant disease and profound is 1.04, right? I mean, there is no demonstrable benefit 
Okay, but it was part of cohort A, so in the pre plan analysis, it's included. You can look at the other studies and you see the response rates are actually pretty poor. Okay, BARD 1 is included in the label, but there's actually no data at all. RAD 51 is also included in the label, but there's actually no data at all. So I think this gets a little bit problematic. You know, you have all these tail of the curve mutations where you're never going to have large numbers. And so, you, you know, you can't expect a dedicated randomized phase three trial for bank A. There's just not enough of these patients. Um, but, you know, the level of evidence is not the same as we see with BRCA1 and 2. That's all I'm saying here on this slide, right, is that there is nuance and it's probably worth understanding. So open questions. We know that PARP inhibitors are valuable in BRCA mutant metastatic castration resistant prostate cancer, but the value in other genes is unknown may be unknowable in rare mutations. The value in ATM is certainly very debatable, potentially dubious, depending upon you know, what uh, perspective you want to look at the data from. But the good news is there's a lot of ongoing trials in earlier disease states and in combinations, you know, neoadjuvant, castration-sensitive disease, CR, first-line CRPC, et cetera. You know, so expect a lot of data on this over the next few years and, and plenty of opportunity to enroll your patients in clinical trials. Uh, that, that uh, ask different questions related to PARP inhibition. Genomic education is definitely our biggest challenge right now in order to get this really rolled out into practice. Uh, you know, we really have to address the gaps in genomic knowledge. Educating providers on this new class of drugs with myelosuppression and GI toxicity as major side effects. You know, it's worth saying these drugs are more like chemo than they are like Abby or Enza. Okay, so you know, it's, it's not a safe thing to give a patient a PARP inhibitor and then see them back in three months. You know, they can come in with a hemoglobin of six, okay? And, you know, we will, at this point, I wouldn't differentiate too much between the drugs apart from their label, uh, but, you know, we'll, we'll dig into that as more studies are reported. All right, that's, that's my presentation, Neil.